All right. Welcome everyone back to Apex Mind. Adam McDaniel here with you. And I'm pleased to welcome to our show this episode, Yukai Cho. Um, Yukai is the inventor of Octalysis Gamification, and he's been a, a very known speaker, book published author, and uh, I, I'm happy to have him because I've followed Yukai for quite a long time. So Yukai, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So um, before we get into Octalysis and gamification, I always like to hear kind of what leads to these things. So um, I'd like to know, when you were growing up, were you a, were you a gamer? I definitely was a heavy gamer when I was growing up. Yeah, what, what types of games did you play when you were a kid? Started with uh, Nintendo games and then um, moved to, you know, Sega and all that stuff. But then got into computer games with RPGs and mm. uh, StarCraft was a, was a game that probably changed a lot of what I was doing. And in 2003, it, what gave me the epiphany to go into this world of gamification uh, was the, the Diablo 2 game. And so... Uh, I'm almost doing gamification for, for 20 years now, which, uh, which is why I'm blessed to be known as a, a pioneer in the, in the field. Yeah, you know, I, I think I had a, a similar story in the fact that, you know, all those, those home-based video games, the, the Nintendos, the Mario Brothers and Segas and so on, you know, those were very straightforward and they were very easy objectives. And then you got into games much later where they were more complex. So what, what was it specifically? I know you say in your book, Diablo 2 changed your life. What, what was it about Diablo 2 that made you so invested in it to where you wanted to, you know, devote time to it? So Diablo 2, like a lot of RPG games, it's about thinking about how to grow a character, right? And like, well, how, what are the actions required to get experience? You level up, you, you assign the right skills and the skill points need to synergize with each other. So if you build your character with unsynergetic skills, they're just kind of wasted, you know, not very good character. And how do you find the right allies that are doing the same quests as you and with complementary skills and then finding the right quests. And so it allowed me to enjoy and, and thrive in a system of meaningful choices and character growth. And the epiphany I had was when I quit Diablo 2, when I realized I spent thousands of hours making my in-game characters amazing and accumulating golden gear, and then I have nothing, you know, and a big part of why I just disappeared. And I thought, why, why couldn't I use the same type of resources and, and creativity and apply it to my own life and be, treat myself as an RPG character and figure out what is the experience I need to gain to level up? What are the skills I need to learn that can be synergetic? What is the role I need to play with my game? Who are the allies I need? And so I think that was the beginning epiphany of applying the skills I learned in Diablo into my real life. Yeah, that, that's awesome. I, I like the way that you, you approach that because a, a lot of us aren't quite so focused on, on how we level up in life, so to speak, using your terms. Um, when you started looking at gamification, this was well before it was like a household name in the maybe the 2010s or so. What, what made you go down that road of applying like gaming techniques to non-gaming situations? Um, I think the beginning years, 2003 to 2010, it was more just about, I have a passion about games, but I know it's not productive. So how can we make productive important things more like a game how to make boring things but important things fun and so again the word gamification wasn't a term i was using i've used the word hey let's gamify it before but it wasn't like a, like a thing it was just like a hey let's just use a, a casual whatever word um and i just started a variety of startups all focused on that center mission about making things more like games uh, i don't so I, again, I think it was just passion driven and a lot of them just because they're so early, they failed and I pivoted to something else, but because I, I didn't do it because I thought it was an opportunity. I did it because I was passionate about it. Uh, I stuck to it and over, over time, you know, uh, things worked out. And like I said, I've worked about like 90, hundred hours every week for six, seven years. And for most of us, there's no pay. So I think if you didn't have the passion and I think some people would quit in year three or year five or year six. And I just couldn't imagine life without, you know, doing it. So I just kept going. Yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, taking away from gamification, anytime people are using their, their time and their effort on their passion, they're going to work a lot harder. And, and I think that's kind of what you get at with this octalysis. Cause 
one, one thing that feels very different to me and why it, it really struck a chord with me. I remember the first time I, I came across you was what I saw your Ted talk, which I'll put the link in the show notes. Um, but you, you give a high level overview of it and it's very different than a lot of other gamification. Um, a lot of gamification just feels kind of tacked on and it, it, it feels like you're using the cheap aspects of a game to, to incorporate it. So why don't you give just a high level overview of, of what Octalis is, is and why it's different than a lot of other gamification out there? Yeah, so the word Octalis is, is a combination between the word octagon and analysis. So it's a visual framework that's an octagon and it breaks down all human motivation into eight core drives. So everything we do is based on one or more of these eight core drives, which means that if there's none of these eight core drives there, there's zero motivation, no behavior happens. So there are core drives like for instance, Epic Mini and Culling you're doing something for a higher purpose, like saving the world or pursuing your faith or maintaining honor and games, you know, you're always like saying, saving the world from something and defending your city. Um, and the question is how to apply that to everyday activities. And then there's also unpredictable and curiosity when you see Easter egg mystery boxes, you know, so all these, all these core drives come into place in the experience. And some are what we call white hat motivation core drives on the top of the octagon. It makes people feel powerful and they feel in control, they feel good, but there's no sense of urgency because we feel in fully control, can do it whenever we want, so we procrastinate. Then the bottom on the, of the octagon, we call them black hat motivation core drives. It makes people feel more urgent, more obsessed, sometimes addicted, uh, but in the long term, if that was the only motivator, we do feel like out of control of their own behavior, and sometimes it, it, it leaves a bad taste in our mouths. And then on the left side of the octagon, I call them left brain core drives versus, versus the right side right brain, which doesn't necessarily mean it's geographically left versus right, but the left brain core drive deal with our, log uh, our logical brain versus the right brain deal with, the, uh, with our uh, emotional brain symbolically. And then, so the left brain core drive deal with extrinsic motivation, things you do for a reward purpose or a goal, but you don't necessarily enjoy the activity itself. So once you obtain the reward, you hit your goals or you get used to the reward, it becomes daily stop doing the activity. Whereas the right brain core drives uh, these are activities you just enjoy doing, intrinsic motivation. You would even pay money just to experience it. And even if you lost all your progress the next day, you would still want to do that activity today because that's how we measure our quality of life, uh, how much time we spend on things we just enjoy doing. So that's the framework. Um, it's, um, you know, people have used the framework a lot. Uh, we know that even ourselves, our design work has empowered over a billion uh, user ex users, and users and user experiences. Um, you know, my book, uh, we sold over 100,000 copies, a handful of billionaires are, are fans that I'm aware of. And, uh, and if you go to Google Scholar and you actually search for the word octalysis, you'll find about close to 2,000 PhD thesis academic journals uh, applying the octalysis. Now, why I think it's different from a lot of other gamecation methodologies, because I think a lot of it came around, especially the buzzword is when there's these gamification platforms and they raised a lot of VC funding and they started marketing and advertising it. And when they say, hey, you need gamification and what is gamification? It's basically what our platform offers, which is giving people points and badges mm -hmm. and, and leaderboards. So, and it almost doesn't make sense, right? It's like saying, hey, we have this really boring activity. And if you do this boring thing a thousand times, we'll give you some points and badges. That's not what it makes a game fun at all, right? And I've done workshops uh, no, throughout the years and uh, one of the things I like to ask the beginning is I think about one game you enjoy playing and why, what makes that the one game you like you know, out of all the games out there. And no one has told me that, oh, because they gave me some points and badges, right? They'll say like, oh, because I can use my creativity and strategize, or I can play with my friends or my kids, or I like the storytelling. You know, there's all these other intrinsic uh, components that make a game en engaging. And so... I think a lot of people who are pushing gamification, they've never really had the feeling of being sucked and absorbed into a game where they wanted to go to bed early, but they just stayed up for so late and it was still an epic experience for them. Like some of them probably, I, I feel like just played some angry birds with their kids. Um, and, then, and then they they see a market opportunity. And so they push that they're gamification experts and uh, and they saw it. So, so I think it's really understanding what's the core psychology components of games versus just the shell of it. Like, oh, there's points in games. So therefore points make things fun. Yeah. There, there's a few things I want to unpack there. Um, cause there's a lot of good things you know, I, I like how you mentioned that, um, 
it, you know, you have these drives and the points badges and leaderboards aren't necessarily the driver. They can be incorporated in good ways. I mean, a lot of competitive online games have those, but look at one of the most popular games of the last 10 years is Minecraft. And as far as I know, I've never played it, but I don't believe it has any of those things. There's no points, badges, or leaderboards. It's creativity. Yeah, it has scores. So, but this is the thing. If you tell people, like if you make a game and you make a really boring game and you say, play this boring game a lot and you'll get points or badges or rewards or status, it doesn't make sense, right? You first make the game engagement by applying those right brain core drives, which is core drive 357. Empowerment of creative feedback, which is giving people meaningful choices, strategy, uh, autonomy, uh, self-expression, making it, giving people core drive five social influence relatedness, which is competition, collaboration, appreciation, uh, and unpredictable curiosity, which is giving people delightful surprises. You make that experience more engaging, more fun and say, hey, if you play this game, uh, this fun game a lot and do well, then you will get status, you'll get rewards, you'll get progression. Um, and I think that makes a lot more sense. And points and badges, frankly, fall into one of the eight core drives, core drive two, development accomplishment. So points are just mathematical counters, shows you a sense of progression. Uh, badges are achievement symbols, symbolize sense of accomplishment. And achievements can be many forms, right? Be badges, trophies, uniform changes, crowns, or black belt, white belt in martial arts. Or of course that lend itself into Six Sigma, which is factory quality management. Uh, but the key thing is that it must symbolize an accomplishment. Like a lot of companies, what they do is they give people badges for every silly thing they do. Mm -hmm. And then the badge is meaningless. It's just an icon, right? Oh, I got a badge for scrolling down. I got a badge for clicking this one button, right? It's just like, it's, it's kind of silly. But if you really did something that you're proud of and it says, hey, here's the symbol that represents what you're proud of and you actually want to brag about it to uh, one people in the platform, like, wow, wow, how did you get purple status, right? Like, no one else knows what purple status means, but it's like everyone there knows how prestigious that is. And then the second is, if you want to tell people outside of the platform, do you, you know, if you got a degree from Harvard, you probably want to call your family and say, hey, I got my degree, yay, right? But most of the badges you get is like, like does it doesn't really matter because there's yeah. no core drive too. There's no feeling of accomplishment. There's only the badge, but no accomplishment. Yeah, I saw that a number of years back. I, I was working at a company where they integrated a, and I believe it was a vendor platform solution with points, badges, and leaderboards. And it's trying to um, push certain like call center behaviors, the same things that the call center would have been pushing without the gamification platform. And the badges didn't mean anything. And it didn't meaningfully change, change the performance um, because it was just kind of arbitrarily tacked on. Um, the other thing I've seen that's kind of arbitrary away from the points, badges, and leaderboards is more of like an e-learning that will pause the learning to play a little game. It's like a little video game segment. And then they'll either ask a quiz question or throw a piece of training knowledge in there. Um, what, what are your thoughts about, you know, how that may harm the, the thought of gamification and how, how it may make leaders in the business think that this is just a waste of time because they see these poor implementations? Yeah, so the reason why you know, the Octalis group, my company is seen as top industry because we have a very disciplined approach on driving business metrics. The first thing we add, we have a five-step design process. The first step is what are your business metrics, right? Basically, if your business metrics go up, then we're successful. If it does not go up, it stays the same. We're a failure, right? Um, who are you targeting? What core drives motivate them more? And this is our investigation. And then desired actions. What are the actions you want them to do? Uh, without thinking about gamification, if you could snap your finger and people could be motivated to do more of some activities, what would, what would you like that to be, right? And if that activity goes up, then it's successful if it's not. Uh, and then the rest is how to motivate that, how to make that engaging or fun so people actually want to do it. And so one of the key things is when you put a gamification design is, is the game actually doing the desired actions? Like you mentioned, there's some games that actually distract you from doing desired actions. Like you're doing triple tax. And then says, hey, now stop, go play this mini game, go play like, I don't know, like go, go play like tic-tac-toe somewhere because you might be bored now. Now that's the wrong thing. You know, you're actually distracting people from desire. Like, that's a terrible design. What you need to do is you need to make filling out the tax form like a game itself, more interesting, more engaging, more meaningful choice, more social. And, uh, and that's the way to design it or more delightful feel. Every time you fill out an extra form, there's some surprise, surprising, delightful thing that shows up. So it makes you want to fill out the next one. So the idea is not to give people little mini games here and there. The idea is making their, what they're supposed to do more intricately interesting. 
Yeah, the game has to be a, a part of the learning, not a separate part of the learning. It, it's something that, that we talk about here all the time is that learning should really be as tied to your flow of work as possible. If you're pausing your work to go do learning, it's not as effective and it's not as realistic with that context. So I, I, I yeah. think that's, oh, go ahead. Yeah, and what, one of our uh, award uh, winning projects, actually we have a couple similar ones. It's really uh, a project uh, of this one is for Procter & Gamble and it's to motivate salespeople to go door to door and, and uh, go to retail stores and say, hey, please you know, order, restock our items, right? And there's another one uh, of a project, which is a restaurant technology, one of the largest in Europe. They, were, they sold for $800 million. Uh, and it's getting salespeople to go knock on restaurants and say, "Hey, please buy our technology." And we have this mobile app to motivate them. And it looks like a it looks like a game, right? It looks it's like you're building a city. You have resources. There's NPC characters. And so a lot of managers will then look and say, "Hey, but is it bad that people are just playing games? Our employees are just playing games." But to keep in mind, the only way to play this game is if you do your job. Like the only way to get any resources is if you go and knock on doors, KPI activities. And if you actually convert a sales, now you have more resources to build your city. So if a person seems to be addictively like playing this game and growing, they're actually closing a lot of sales. They're actually getting a ton of business. Now, the side effect is they'll actually be enjoying it. So I don't know if that's unbearable for a business or not, but they'll be actually be enjoying it as opposed to feeling it sucks because they're working hard. Um, and, and so those, those results, right? The, the one we run award for, uh, we saw KP activities go up by more than 60% and their overall revenue uh, increased more than 20% just from, from this game. Um, so, so it's like, again, people would understand that and then they'll look at it again. They're like, but aren't they just playing games? But it's like the game is doing their job basically. And they, basically it's a job with a gamified scoreboard. Yeah, you know, I think the difference between that and the example I gave is they're having to perform first and then they get the, the game is the reward after they perform the expected activity versus the the e-learnings that are like you go play Space Invaders and then it gives you a quiz, quiz question The the game is almost more of a distraction from the learning that it's contributing towards it. Uh, the, yeah, the game is more like a interesting feedback engine for you. It's not even just it's not even the reward. It's just a, a better feedback system. Oh, that makes sense. Um, so, you know, I, I know that that's an app example and, and there is technology that can be using this. So how, for folks that might have like maybe smaller budgets, they don't, they can't invest in a platform. Are, are there also lower technology ways to incorporate yeah. Octalysis? Yeah, sure. Just like, like games could be like World of Warcraft, a lot of technology it could be hide and seek, no technology, um, just people keeping track. And our brain really doesn't care how we receive those eight core drives, right? Uh, it could be through email, it could be through motivation speech or 3D world or virtual VR, it doesn't matter. So the question is how to implement. So there's some, some uh, sometimes just a poster on the board that's like keeping track of people's scores or leaderboard, or uh, sometimes it's an analog, like a, like a brainstorming a game that, that helps people learn things faster, a flashcard game. Sometimes it's just an incentive program. How do you design interesting incentive programs to get people, like if people if employees actually work together, um, they actually get, get bigger bonuses as opposed to the normal way, which is you kind of leave each other in the dust so, so that you can, you can win and you can be the one that gets the credit. Yeah, and that's a good call out. I think most businesses are already doing some sort of employee incentive or motivation program. So it's really just incorporating that into the overall you know, narrative even possibly too. Um, to dive into some of those Octalysis um, components, you know, the, the first one is epic meaning and calling, which, you know, narratives work. Um, I see apps that always tell you that you're a part of something bigger, you know, at work, you could be started something bigger, but sometimes I've seen narratives that like just become really cheesy and tacked on. Yeah. yeah. So for, for core drive one, epic meaning and calling design, believability is everything. Mm -hmm. Like if you say, Hey, you're changing the world and people don't believe you then it's a slap in the face. And this happens a lot when people join a company, you know, on day one, uh, they see some purpose statement that's like onboarding, that's like really engaging. And, uh, and it's like, they're just out of cause like, wow, this is so cool. This is about changing the world. And on day two, they realize like, no one cares about this purpose statement and the executives don't even remember. It doesn't really matter. And then mm -hmm. when they go to the second company, they're already smart enough to not even care about on day one. Right. And because there's no believability. And so, one company that I've been very, very impressed with was uh, Lego. I, I did some consulting in Denmark for them. 
And when I got there, uh, I talked to a variety of employees and, and there's their purpose and they'll tell like, oh, we have these, these DNA principles, like we want to inspire creative play, et cetera, et cetera. And then I met someone who says, yeah, I moved from Boston to, to this small town called Billen in Denmark, like I think like 5,000 population. And I thought I was just going to be here for two years because it's a, it looks great on my resume, creative role, I create a company in the world. Uh, and I can just job hop, but I, this is, but I've been here for 16 years and I don't see myself ever leaving. I guess this is my destination career. I'm going to retire here. There's another guy who said that um, he got a big opportunity to get a big promotion to a director and a huge salary raise, but he turned it down because he feels his current position actually can fulfill Lego's purpose better uh, because it's close to the customer. So this is crazy, right? Because most people who work at a company, they're doing the core drive two game, which is develop an accomplishment. They're climb, they do a good job, they get promoted, they do a good job, they get promoted, climbing that ladder. And so why would people sacrifice that, that rise for, for the purpose? And that's why they're doing, that's because they're doing the epic meaning calling. And so what Lego does, so when you do epic meaning and calling design, there's a few things that are important. Number one is that uh, for to build believability. Number one is that the the per, the entity that claims the core drive one, like the the epic mini calling, needs to seem like they really believe they're really serious about it. Number two is the extension of that, which is they do sacrificial actions for it, and they need to reiterate it. Like I said, a lot of times purpose statements are on onboarding, and it just never mentioned again. With Lego, they'll constantly mentioned their purpose statement. I remember I was meeting with another team in Denmark, another company, and I was just name dropping like, oh yeah, I work with them with Lego. And they're like, oh, Lego, those guys are so annoying. I'm like, oh wait, how, like, why would you not, why would anyone not like, like a Lego? Like, what do you, why are they annoying? And it's like, yeah, because in every single meeting, they'll say, before we start the meeting, let us remind you that we stand for these principles. We stand for like, we create, that's like, we know you tell us every single meeting, right? So they reiterate it. It's very important. A lot of companies, they just mention something, the purpose and they stop. Number two, they do sacrificial actions for it. So Lego tells us their core DNA about creative plays, about core drive three, empowerment of creative and feedback. And they said, this is our DNA, this is what we stand for. But in the past 10 years, the, the things that make the most amount of money are you know, the, the Star Wars set, Avengers, that's core drive for ownership of possession, extrinsic motivation. And so even though we make a lot of money from that, it's not our DNA because people put it together and there's no creativity. It looks so beautiful. They just keep it there as a model. But to be creative, you have to break it apart and make new things. And they said, even though we make a lot of money, that's not who we really like. Can you teach us how to break, take us back to our roots? So Lego's saying that, hey, we're willing to maybe not make as much money, but try to fulfill our purpose statement more, right? And when you have that, suddenly employees believe the, the epic meaning calling more. Unlike other companies, they just say, yeah, we, we want to make the world better, but obviously we're, all our decisions going to be what's what helps the bottom line, right? Uh, like Tesla, Tesla says they're there to uh, sustain, uh, accelerate the transition towards uh, sustainable energy, right? And in 2014, they gave away, they said, hey, you, any company can use our electric car patents. And then people are like, oh, are they trying to trick their competitors? What's going on? And I said, no, because we cannot complete our purpose if only one company in the world does electric cars, right? We'll fail for sure. We can only be successful if every company, like a lot of companies in the world do electric cars. Now, hopefully we're still number one, but either way, we just can't succeed if we don't do it. And then people's like, wow, they're serious. They believe in their actual mission to even like help competitors because they believe in the industry should, should thrive. And that's when you have diehard Tesla fans because like employees and, and uh, investors and uh, buyers because of that, uh, that sacrificial stuff. And there's more things to, there's like a list of things to make sure there's more believability, but it's not easy. But when you do it, you know, that's when people take sacrificial action for your company because you show that you're willing to take sacrificial action for the purpose. Yeah, I think that's good. You know, when, when you talk about the, you know, mission vision is what a lot of companies will call them. And, and a lot of companies don't live that. They give it to you when you first come in and it's probably written on a board and a, and a website. I, I do like how Lego repeats it in their meetings, but I think also leaders have to live that too um, and, and, you know, make it a part of the culture. Um, I, I am a big fan of Lego. I don't know if you could see on my bookcase, but I have the Statue of Liberty back there. And, and you know, they, they're known for being a quality company. And, and I think that culture is what builds that, right? It's not just it's not just uh, the product quality, it's it's the people there. And that's great that they can do that. Um, I wanna shift to empowerment of creativity and feedback. Um, I know we've talked plenty about development and accomplishment, um, but 
you mentioned this in your book. Sometimes it's challenging to be creative in, in a corporate structure. The larger your company, the more bureaucracy you're going to have, the more rules you're going to have. And someone who maybe wants to implement octalysis or, you know, just change things up might have some pushback. So, you know, how, how do you suggest addressing that if creativity is hard to implement in the workplace? Uh, from whose standpoint, who's trying to solve this problem? Is it the, um, the, the executive, the manager, or the employee who's stuck in bureaucracy? I would say that most likely, let's say a manager who doesn't have that decision-making authority, like they, they want to make something creative happen, but someone above them or someone in another team might be blocking that. Um, yeah, so I think, because every company is different, every scenario, and, this, and the siloed situation in the bureaucracy is, is something that's very tough. I'm actually... Uh, on the sideline, very slowly working on a silo bus busting uh, framework to help companies bust silos and nice. help get organized to work together more. Uh, because I see that as one of the biggest pains, like giant companies can't innovate. Um, so, so would you say then that that you, if you're in that situation, that until there is a silo busting framework available, that maybe you you need to get like sponsorship or endorsement from a more senior leader so that you can, you know, move forward with something that's more creative or outside the box. Yeah. I mean, they call this uh, politics, right? And if you've ever watched like house of cards, like the job of the politician, the, you know, in Congress is to just get more people to agree to work together, right? Hey, I'll give you this benefit. Hey, come do the vote for this. And it's like just going out that they call the whip. Right. And so literally if you want to get a lot of stuff and stuff done in a big organization, you do have to, uh, and, and this is the big thing. Okay. So we have a two by two for corporate player types. There's a uh, high performance, um, average performance, not low performance, normal performance, and then non-political political. And so if you're a non-political and, and normal performer, you're a survivor, you're just there to, you know, to get your job done, get a paycheck, not get fired. Right. Uh, then there's the performers, which are people who are high performance and, no politics. So these are people who believe that, hey, if I do a good job, I'll get promoted. Uh, they hate politics. Right? They just want to do a good job. That's all. Mm -hmm. Then there's the politicians who, you know, they get their average performance, not bad, but average, but they spend a lot of time thinking about, okay, how do I get, how do, how do I network with the VP, get lunch together, play golf together, let them know I'm important part of this project, right? The politicians. And then there's the stars, which are the high performance, high political. So they're the people who says like, okay, I'm going to figure out how to get these five departments to all work together to accomplish this next big thing. Um, and so a company, a lot about a company's culture is decided based on how the politicians are treated. Because if the politicians are the one that's rewarded, the performers, they don't want to, they still look down upon doing politics. They still want to do it. But then they just feel like, oh, hard work is pointless, stupid. So they drop down to be a survivor. Whereas the survivors, they're like, oh, wow, looks like that guy isn't doing a good job either like me or normally. But they just spend all their time like eat, like having lunch with the, the, the directors and VPs. So maybe yeah. I should do that too. So you drive like a hardcore like politician culture. So, um, so I think, but keep in mind for the stars, the stars know that in order for innovation to happen, for bigs to happen, they can't just perform by themselves because, you know, an organizer, you can't just be a solo player. You have to get everyone to agree and push for it together. So they're actually good at going and networking and saying, all right, let's do this together. Hey, we want to push this very, very innovative theme, but we, we can't deal without your department's approval and, and, and support. Can we do this? And uh, we'll make sure you'll also get credit, all that stuff. So, so that kind of stuff is very important uh, to do good work. And this is what a lot of performers don't see. They just like, oh, all that stuff is just like greasy, like like lip service work. Uh, and I, so that's that's something you would do in that position. Yeah, and and that can absolutely destroy a culture if that starts becoming too too prevalent. Um, I, I want to shift to some of the more black hat um, type ones because I think some people might be scared that these would demotivate people or or you know ruin the culture. So something like you know scarcity and impatience, you know. In games, I lose a streak if I don't log in, you know, for a certain day, right? But I, I think some some leaders might be scared to implement things like that in the workplace because they think that employees may be um, demotivated. So, what are your thoughts yeah, on I, that? I'll first quickly say for Core Drive Three Empowerment of Critic Feedback, one really good example is twenty percent time uh, that Google implemented. So. A lot of people, when they leave a corporate job, it's because they have this really creative idea, like, hey, maybe we can solve problems like this. And it got shut down 
did a bureaucracy. And then they're like, oh, but this idea is so great. I must try it. And they go in and start their company, right? And then so Google says, hey, you know, you have 20% time one day of the week. You can work on whatever you want as long as the IP belongs to Google. So then like people, these entrepreneurs are suddenly feeling like, oh, you know, it's a lot of risk, a lot of work. Why don't I just do it in the comfort of Google? And so back in the day, 20% time actually launched 80% of Google's products. And some of the most successful products like Google News, Gmail, all came up 20% time, right? And people were retained. They're happy, they retain, they stay there. So that's an example of giving people, you know, on a more executive level, right? Giving your employees that empowerment of creativity, giving them autonomy, meaningful choices, self-expression, and people are happy and you get more productivity out of it. Um, so for Black Hat motivation, so Black Hat is meant for short bursts of activity. So like I said, um, it's usually you get people to work obsessively towards something, but uh, in the long term, they could feel like they could burn out. So if you have like a one or two week competition in your company, that's kind of cool. You know, people are excited. They're thrilled. They're like adrenaline's high. They do a little trash talking with each other. Uh, so it's fun, right? And you'll probably see like a, like a bump in activity. However, if you're a year long competition, most people don't like to be in a constant state of competing with their colleagues and coworkers. And it creates a cutthroat culture and a lot of people just burn out and leave the company. So, so again, if you use Black Hat motivation, a lot of it is short bursts, it's okay. Now, some people like scarcity, they get strung a lot, like, oh, they're all, you know, they don't feel joy in the company because all the other core drives are lacking, but, you know, they're waiting for their vesting schedule, right? They're waiting for their next, yeah. uh, that, you know, their, their cliff to happen. And so that just kind of like the next carrot, the next carrot, the next carrot. And you know that, they're probably engaged, but they're not excited. And, and the moment the, the carrot is gone, like, you know, wh when you give people the, their, their cliff, right, the vested stock, that's supposed to be the big reward time. That's what's like, yeah, I got a big reward. I should work harder. I should want to do more, right? But that's when a lot of people quit and leave because they're only continuing because they feel like they were just pursuing that carrot. Now it's okay to bridge, like maybe people would have left three months ago, but you want to make sure that these three months, you're adding other core jobs, you're adding social appreciation, you're adding all the other core jobs we just talked about. Um, and then we have core drive seven, unpredictability and curiosity, which is just adding more delightful surprises into an ex into their daily work. You know, have have things that are surprising, have things that are interesting, because most people do feel like their job is very monotonous. It's the same thing. There's no delight anymore. And just add, you know, that's why some, some websites you go to, every time you go on that shows you a uh, like a very breathtaking view, right? That's always different and gives you like a motivation quote. So you always feel like, hey, your, your brain subconsciously feels like I want to go there more because I don't know what I don't know what's going to be uh, pleasantly there to surprise me. Uh, so having a bit more uh, pl a pleasant surprise, again, uh, unpredictability works very well if it's tied to a pleasant experience. If it's tied to a negative experience, then it magnifies the fear greatly. Uh, so you want to make sure there's that delightful surprise, not like, one day they discover they, they're punished. Of course, that's that's like the opposite of the Easter egg. Yeah, no, that that's fair. Um, and, and I, I realized that I, I probably gave an example that was probably more loss and avoidance when I asked you about scarcity. And I, I think of the example for scarcity is like, you know, maybe a sales team over three days, it's who who, who can, you know, perform the best over this period of time. So we only have this short period. And, and I like that you called out that that's really effective over smaller periods. I Sometimes you see these um, campaigns in offices that go for far too long. You know, it's like a quarterly yeah. thing and people burn out. I, I, I think what's insightful in what you said, and, and it's also impressive that you pointed out yourself that you have the mild correction on core drives, but most people, when they do uh, streak design, they think it's core drive to development accomplished. Yes, 10 days in a row, 20, 50 days in a row. Amazing. Like they think people are just feeling more and more accomplished, but inevitably it always becomes loss and avoidance. People are just scared to lose their, they're strict. They're afraid to go on airplanes because what if they miss that one day? And again, in the short run, as long as they're maintaining the streak, they're obsessed, right? They're on every single day. Your metrics will look great if you're onto data driven design. But they don't, they sometimes feel demoralized. And the moment they lose their streak, they're like, all right, um, I guess that was a good run, but I don't think I'm ever going to do like 80 days in a row anymore. So I'm just going to quit this or take a break or quit, right? And so people burn out from that black hat experience. So I think it's very, app that you actually are aware that streak design, which sounds like it's about accomplishment, actually is about Black Hat loss and avoidance.
Yeah. When, and you mentioned that you, you have to balance it, right? You have to keep the white hat positive motivators in there so that the black hat, you know, potentially negative motivators aren't demotivating people. Um, yeah. And, and I want to fully clarify that white hat, black hat is not defined by positive negative. It okay. literally means white hat, we feel more in control and black hat, we feel out of control. So uh, for instance, uh, core drive seven, unpredictable curious is, is on the right bottom, right? Which means it's intrinsic our brains enjoy it, it's black and we feel out of control. So that's when, again, you wanna go to bed at 10 p.m. and then you binge watch Netflix till four in the morning. Again, mm -hmm. your brain enjoys it, but you felt out of control, right? It's not that it's negative per se. Some people put themselves in black hat to work out more as opposed to watch all this Netflix. Um, but it just feels like, but, and, and, you, and you go to the white hat and the right brain core drives and it's like empowerment. So instead of unpredictable, like, I don't know what's gonna happen next. It's like, I am empowered with meaningful choice. If you look at left brain core drives, black, uh, black hat is scarcity. Oh, I don't have it yet. White hat is, oh, I have it and I feel good. So it literally is just in control, out of control. And therefore there's some consequences about maybe you don't feel great because you're out of control, but some people use it to kick themselves in the butt to do things they always want to do, but just didn't have enough discipline to do. Yeah, th thanks for calling me out on that. Because sometimes I try to oversimplify things and I don't want to distort it. Because I, I look at unpredictability specifically. You talked about like, you know, having rewards maybe be unpredictable. And, and I like that. I've seen it, it used well in workplaces where um, instead of just having the set metrics and the set reward programs, maybe there's a metric you're trying to promote that you don't tell people you're you're rewarding yes. and you okay. randomly reward people for it. So, so there's different reward structures, unpredictability. There's the fixed action reward. You know what you need to do. You know what, what the reward is. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the mystery box. You know what you need to do, but you don't know what the reward is. So it's like opening a treasure chest. Uh, there's the Easter egg. You don't know, you don't even know what you need to do. And you just randomly get the reward. It surprises you a lot, which means it gives you the max amount of delight. And there's all pros and cons. The one very important literature that I just want to throw out there because a lot of people don't know this is that like, when it comes to mystery box, which is again, you do something, but you don't know what the reward is. It works well if it's a short commitment. Uh, it's a small, it's a short, a short duration and small commitment. So because you're curious, you might try it again and, and see, oh, I, is it good? Is it good? Cool, cool, cool. But if it's a drawn out commitment, people don't want to do it because it might be wasting their time because they don't know if the reward is good or not. And this is why, I don't know if you know the literature, like uh, World of Warcraft tried to copy Diablo and their dungeon strategies, but then people get pissed with World of Warcraft because the Diablo, you can solo one of your dungeons, they call the rifts, uh, like for, with one person in 16 minutes. So if you get something bad, hey, you just start again, try again. So you just pull mm -hmm. the slot machine. Hey, nothing interesting, nothing. For World of Warcraft, you need to first get four other people. It takes 30 minutes just to get to the right place. And it might take one hour to three hours to finish it. So if at that point, the reward is not good, you're pissed, you think this game is stupid. So there's a lot of people who think, oh, adding unpredictability to your reward is, is great, but no, it, only if it's a short commitment, right? So there's a, and my point is, there's a lot of these little intricate uh, systems and, and, and design disciplines in all these core drivers, how to design gamification stuff. And so that's the stuff you need to know when you're implementing good game cache design, as opposed to, hey, let's just give them Easter egg. Let's give them points. You know, let's just yeah. give this because you need to, design it correctly to be effective and, and motivate long-term behavior. Yeah. You know, when you say mystery box, the first thing that I think of is Mario Kart. And, and if I get something bad from the mystery box, you know, bad meaning like the green shell or the banana, well, I know there's another option to get something else where it might be one of the cool prizes next time. But if I only got one of those per level, I might get mad if I got like the bad prize versus the good prize. Yeah, this is also why uh, League of Legends uh, community is known to be more toxic than let's say Overwatch or Heroes of the Storm because each game is longer. So if you get matched with a bad teammate and it means you're probably gonna lose, but it's gonna restart in five minutes, you don't, you know, you're upset, it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. With a game that's like 50, 40, 50, 30 minutes long, you're in minute 10 and you already have a bad teammate. You know, this teammate is gonna make you lose the game. But you still have to pay up, play another 30 minutes before you actually lose. And you're pissed. So you're toxic. You're yelling at people. 
Yeah. Well, and, and another example that comes to mind is a lot of the, the modern mobile games that are um, accused of being pay to play. You know, you, you could get something nice in the in the random mystery box, but most of the time you don't like 95. Oh, it's, it's, uh, it's free to play, but pay to win. is what yeah. they uh, usually say. And so this is the this is the controversy of game design, which is everyone wants to wants to do things for free. Right. So mm -hmm. so they make the game for free. But in order to make you want to play, they have to add agony into the game. And so then you pay them to remove the agony, which is stupid, right? Because people say, well, I just want to pay a game company and they give me the max amount of fun possible. Mm -hmm. But no, with this model, they actually have to arbitrarily make you feel pain. So then they're like the drug, like you pay them and they alleviate the pain they give you. So, so that's, the con that's, that's a big controversy in game design. I think that's especially true for, for older folks that grew up in the old Nintendo Sega Genesis era. Cause when we bought a game, we got the game, we got the whole package. There was no microtransactions or anything. And, and now it seems like whether it's a free game or even sometimes the, the paid games on the consoles, you know, what comes in the box is somewhat minimal and you end up having to like pay extra to get the full experience or to speed it up. Like you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, I a comparable, I'd say, if you call this computer old days, is like arcade games. We just have to keep throwing more money, more money to just keep going and seeing the next piece of content. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit more like you pay to play the game, but you know they're designed to make you die relatively quickly, so you have to keep paying to keep going. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a bit of that that dynamic like now with microtransactions. Oh, pay a dollar, you died. Pay a dollar to come back to life, right? It's a little bit like that, but yeah. obviously one is you have to go to a physical location and you're prepared like a casino, like you're prepared this much money. Whereas now it's in your hands on mobile and you can all day long, just keep giving the money. Yeah. Um, well, the last question on like, tell us this, I want to ask is like, wh what would you say to someone who says like, Hey, you know, our, our workplace, they don't want to play games. They're, they're adults and they don't want to play video games. How would you address that? Yeah. Like I said, it's not about getting people to play games. It's implementing the core drives that are found in games that happen to motivate all of us. So if you give people an environment, right, that says, okay, now you have a, you, you see a higher purpose and meaning in your work. Mm -hmm. There is a stronger sense of uh, progression towards mastery, right? And you, and you see progress better. You have a much more autonomy and meaningful choices. There's more social appreciation like your, your employees actually have better teamwork and, and there's more triggers to express appreciate each other. There's a compensation structure that makes more sense. Like no one's going to see this like, hey, I don't want to play a game. Get me out of here, right? They're like, yeah. yeah, sign me up. I would love to be in those environments. And those are the things that are in games that attract people so much. It's just you take that same element and you make the workplace enjoyable like a game. It's not turning the workplace into a game. It's making it enjoyable like a game. And the best designs are people don't even know you know, it's the, they don't think it's game. They just have, they just feel like they always want to be there and they're happy. Yeah, that makes sense. So you're focusing more on the core drives or the motivational factors than like gaming elements, like maybe some platform vendors might be trying to do. Um, the other aspect to that, that I know I've heard you talk about before is just the demographics of gamers. So um, I, I think maybe in 2022, this wouldn't be as much of a surprise as when you first started talking about this. But I mean, when you look at the demographics of gamers, how are they different than what, what we thought like way in the past i mean again i think what surprised a lot of people is just like there's half of the gamers are women especially if you look at social mobile games candy crush all that stuff uh the average gamer is like close to 40 years old you know most people uh in our in our time of like grew up with games so basically everyone plays games if you give them reason now some people don't play because they think it's for kids or it's a waste of time uh, but if you give them a reason to, you know, everyone can enjoy games. My, my father, who is a retired ambassador for a government, he plays his like Mahjong iPad game all day long. And mm -hmm. my, my mother-in-law, who is 75, I think, she plays Candy Crush a bunch, like every, all the time. So, yep. you know, people, people just play, play games. And um, so, so saying that at least those core drives don't motivate people is like saying, people don't want to feel competent. They want to feel incompetent and they don't want to feel appreciated. They want to feel unappreciated. Mm -hmm. You know, for most cultures, um, I think all cultures that's seen as psychological disease. Right. Yeah. Um, and it's just games are games exist just to give you those good feelings. Hey, I feel progress. I feel accomplished. I feel like I'm saving the world. I feel like I'm working with a team to beat things. Right. And the question is, we want that. Our brains want that in all the environments we will go to. It just happens that games provide it. So we go to games. 
But if our work provides, if our home provides it, we just, we want to go, go there more. We just want to spend more time there. Yeah. Well, I, I know my mom's in her sixties and she has that iPad that she's constantly playing the mobile games too. I, I it, it's amazing how 10 years ago, you would have never caught people like that playing a video game. And I think the mobile landscape really changed that. Um, so let's, let's shift away. We've talked a lot about like kind of motivating in the workplace. Um, what else have you worked on or seen done where like gamification has, has um, impacted or Octalysis is impacted besides just like workplace performance? Yeah, I think, first of all, the sweet spot of gamification are things that are very important, but potentially mundane or boring. So I got a lot of projects in healthcare and education and insurance and finance. Um, and then I think a lot of uh, new technology trends like to you know bring gamification in. So done a lot in VR, AR, metaverse. I was actually um, a contracting head of Creative Labs and Digital Commerce for HTC, wow. pushing their Vive uh, VR and AR stuff, um, blockchain, uh, NFT, Web3 stuff. So I was also contracting chief experience officer for one of the co-founders of Ethereum, uh, creating delightful blockchain experiences. So I think just all these type of uh, technology trends have, uh, have heavily used gamification. Also just to you know, get kindergartners to eat healthily, work with uh, the second largest Jewish website to get Jewish people to uh, have more faith towards their God, uh, work with a steel manufacturer, the largest steel manufacturer in the world in, in Brazil uh, to get, uh, to reduce injuries, to have them have safer behavior. So it's really across the board. It's really uh, getting uh, airplane pilots to talk to their, their uh, customers more humorously so it makes mm -hmm. their flight experience more pleasant, especially if there's a delay. Uh, yeah, just across the board, just whatever people want in terms of, hey, let's let's increase motivation in in, in this area. You know, we get we get brought in. Yeah, and, and I like that you mentioned fitness because I think that there's a lot of different fitness apps that do a good job, whether they be like the trackers and the watches or like the um, calorie tracker type. They they in integrate a lot of those those concepts well. Um, I just want to touch real quick. You mentioned like blockchain and NFTs. And I know recently there's just been some talk about like crypto and NFTs. And, and I think just like our gamification vendors, that some of them almost just seem to be charlatans that are just throwing a product out. That all That's also true in that space, which is why you've seen some challenges specifically around like the, the image and the NFTs that were sold to people. So um, how can effective, you know, Octalysis or gamification make sure that that's like an industry that is credible and is providing a good, you know, service versus maybe some of the people who aren't doing good stuff yes. out there. So the, the first disclaimer out there out there is I, you know, I also started a NFT platform company called Metablocks. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about combining real world uh, places with real life memories. Uh, but I, I got into this space because I started getting a lot of invitations to consult on Web3 NFT projects. And it's because apparently my book became a very popular read in this space. Hmm. Uh, when I wrote the book, I didn't have this in mind, right? There's no NFTs, but um, but then people said it's a must read and I started seeing it. And, and I think just like anyone else, when they first look at an NFT, it's like really curious, like, like why is this worth so much money? Like why are these JPEGs kind of weird? Uh, so I did an analysis of it and it really boils down and I have a full speech about it. It was really about three core drives. Scarcity, it's a digital thing that's scarce. And so I talk about, you know, I sold 100,000 books, but those books are all fungible. People just want the knowledge of text so they can trade the text. It doesn't matter. The eBooks or audiobooks just as good. But mm -hmm. in my lifetime, I've signed about two to 300 books and those are non-fungible. Each book is kind of uniquely different. It creates a stronger connection with the author. Uh, and if they exchange it, it's just different, right? And so, uh, so that scarcity in a digital sense is, is useful. Actually, a lot of people say, oh, I wish there's a way for you to sign my digital Kindle book, my digital book, right? And they're like, yeah, I can send, I can like send you my digital signature and could paste it there, but it just means a bit different, right? And then so scarcity, meaning and, and community. So meaning is like, I have a friend uh, in Denmark who uh, owns a broken rugged couch. Uh, and it has no utility, it has no cosmetics, but he cherishes it greatly because uh, it used to be Winston Churchill's couch. And he believes Winston Churchill is a, is a war hero, right? So the memory, the meaning behind this thing that's supposedly kind of trash uh, makes it very valuable. So that meaning in the NFT world is like, oh, 
uh, this represents women empowerment or gender equality, or this represents like supporting artists, like musicians, or this represents like, oh, I, I just love the celebrity and I just want to be part of the project, right? And which is getting close, creating that closer relationship like with the author. Um, and then, so that's the meaning and purpose part. Uh, but if my friend was the only person who cared about Winston Churchill, um, then he probably can't sell it to anyone else. It's just valuable to him. So that's the community part. If 100,000 people all cared about Winston Churchill, he could probably sell it to someone else who could sell it for a higher price. So that's that's the core of NFT. And what I and obviously the NFT market, like the crypto markets, goes up and down like like crazy. Oh, and there's a lot of people who are dishonest about it. there's a, because there's so much money involved. Uh, the NFT space is kind of like, you know, I'm sure you heard people say it's like the, the internet, like in the early days, the oh, dial yeah. up before dial up, right? But the problem is back in the day, it's a lot of friction, a lot of pain, a lot of hard, 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 hardship, but there isn't that all this money going around and people getting rich. So it's, it's usually the nerds who are, who are passionate about the technology, who are, who are, who are okay with seeing all this this error code, error messages, right? And they're figuring this out because they think they can, this can change the world. And then it only got to the mainstream um, and, and used commercially when it was more ready. Now, because the blockchain NFT world, there's so much money, people's like, oh, my neighbor got rich and everyone's going in all this greed. And suddenly there's a lot of chaos and fusion and you attract all the, uh, all the scammers. There's a lot of scammers. Uh, mm -hmm. who say like, oh yeah, do this. And they, they, they call it, they, they do rug pulls, what they call it. They screw people with money. Um, but I, I also want to talk about one thing, which is like the foundational technology of creating that, that sense of scarce meaning in a digital product. That I think is a very solid technology. Just like in a dot-com bubble, right? The dot-com bubble burst 19, uh, in 2001, and, and Mm -hmm. Dot-com did not fail. Dot-com was very useful. These websites, useful. What failed was the, the financing, the exuberance, like yep. and the, the money going in. So people thought, oh, this website's not worth $10 billion. It's only worth $100 million. And they need to sell. They lose all their money. Sometimes they oversell. The company dies, right? But it's already amazing how a, a website is worth $100 million, right? Yeah. And, so, and, and we know the companies that survive through today a lot of the most valuable assets the world of dot coms yep. right so the technology foundation is useful it just thre even throughout 2001 it was growing the foundation is getting better more mature more banks more companies using it and you see that in crypto too right the financing yeah this like this nft is not worth 200 200 million dollars okay 20 million dollars this nft is probably worth two thousand yeah. dollars but you know it's it's pretty meaningful that an artist can create a digital piece of art that he can sell for two thousand dollars Right. Exactly. And so that part is meaningful and that part is growing and more, more people are using it just like more banks are using Bitcoin technology, blockchain technology, uh, governments are using the foundation is growing. And then the distracting part is the, the valuation and the exuberance. So I think it's important to, if you want to predict the future, where's that you want to see the foundation, if it's growing, if it's starting to replace old systems, you don't want to unless they think it's fun, right? You don't want to get caught up on the, the exuberant financing markets. Yeah, exactly. And I like your comparison to the dot-com bubble. Cause I remember back then there was like animals.com. It was a, it was a very like well-known URL, but it didn't provide a lot of value. Um, and, and I think right now, yeah, you see some challenges in crypto and NFTs because of that money, but you also see that in tech startups too. There was a lot of money thrown at those and only certain ones are going to be doing well in the future. Um, I want to shift. We're, we're running out of time here, but I do want to say, I like that you mentioned there's only two to 300 of your signed books because I am one of those two to 300. So um, for anyone on video or, or if you're on audio, you have to believe me, but um, I feel honored to know that I have this very scarce um, item that means a lot to me. Um, it'd mean a lot to me, even if it wasn't signed. But I think to your point, I don't have a lot of signed books. And when you have one, it does mean more than just the average it, book. It wouldn't be the same if I if I emailed you a digital signature, right? No, no. Um, there's something about that tactile um, real thing. So um, a couple of things. First off, I want to give you a chance to um, tell people where they can find you or connect with you. Yeah. So the main place that, that has all my stuff is yukaichow.com. Um, also, my Twitter is at Yukai Chow, uh, Y U K I C H O U. And then there you can, based on what you're interested, you can find my book. 
uh, that leads to Amazon. You can find my TEDx talk. You can find my education platform across Prime. You can check out my NFT project, metablocks.co, if you want, but or consulting across groups. But all my stuff originates from my my blog, ukaichiao.com. Okay, perfect. I'll put both of those in the show notes so people can find you. Um, and then the last question I ask every guest is, um, what do you do to perform at your peak? I actually uh, enjoy and have fun. Nice. Anything in particular, or it's just a general life philosophy? I optimize for, for happiness, and enjoyment when I decide what I'm going to work on and how I'm going to do the work. That, that's some amazing advice. Well, Yukai, thank you so much for being on. Thanks everybody for listening and we'll see you next time. Thank you. See you next time.